we now have two discussions, and the first one is Anad Admati. And uh, let's go on. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me very much. I think this panel, unlike the, uh, some of the other ones, uh, is progressing very linearly. It's alphabetical, it seems, but there's sort of this uh, increasing pitch. And I think uh, some are going to take the pitch ever higher, if that's possible. Um, so we heard um, from Eric about the connectivity of uh, the market just in Europe itself. And he didn't take the arrows from Germany to the US because uh, his map was only that of Europe. And uh, the progress that's made in trying to, to control that, host country, home country, et cetera. And we heard from uh, Claudio about one element of Basel III, which is uh, among the things that Basel III uh, uh, has a breakthrough in, which is to have buffers. Um, two kinds of buffers, in fact, and both of them are good ideas. Um, and then we began to, uh, to hear about uh, how Dodd-Frank is a step in the right direction, but we need more vocal rule and, and other things. And then uh, we had a brutal uh, assessment here um, and a pointing out to a political problem and a capture and all of that. What, what, what I would like to do is uh, sound huge alarms on both counts. Well, one of them was not, was not really expressed yet, except maybe uh, by Ellen Taylor earlier today, by Gordon Brown, and then, of course, by, uh, by Schenger around here, uh, which is uh, not as much about the form of Basel, although I do have some complaints about that, too, uh, in terms of uh, the risk weights that are used, et cetera, uh, but about the level uh, of Basel. So we heard, starting yesterday with Ken Rogoff, that uh, excessive leverage is a problem, and we have heard this throughout. Uh, too much debt, too much borrowing, and that creates a lot of instability. So high leverage uh, is a problem, and it has a negative externality. It creates systemic risk. It creates situations where individual banks and financial institutions uh, become distressed, if not fail. Even when they're distressed, uh, some of their counterparties go to the door. They have to deliver, fire sale, all kinds of things start happening. And when they're interconnected, it reverberates through the system and uh, can cause a crisis uh, uh, quickly. Uh, so what does Basel do? It raises uh, capital requirements. Uh, and the kind of numbers we're talking about are 4.5% to 7% plus this counter-cyclical buffer uh, of not of total balance sheets, uh, but of uh, risk-weighted balance sheets. Uh, well, that's not a balance sheet really, but of risk-weighted risk assets, which is a number much smaller in most cases uh, than total balance sheet, total value of assets by a large uh, fraction. In other words, um, AAA securities, uh, sovereign debt even, a lot of different kinds of uh, assets that are held by banks and financial institutions uh, do not count at all, as if they have no risk at all. Uh, we've seen that they can have risk, even AAA. We see that they even have systemic tail risk, and in fact that's how uh, financial institutions uh, increase their actual leverage before the crisis, uh, getting to have a situation where they had 1%, uh, uh, 1 to 2 to 3% of total balance sheet in equity. And I use the word equity instead of capital because one of the ways in which uh, we get confused by this discussion is the use of words that uh, are only used like this uh, in banking, like the word capital. Um, the best kind of capital is equity capital, some a form of capital that finances the uh, productive sectors in the economy very happily. And where uh, the area where I come from, Stanford, uh, is filled with, uh, with companies that uh, are very happy to, uh, to exclusively use uh, equity uh, to fund their productive and successful and thriving operations. What we have in banking is the situation in which uh, leverage is very high. Uh, it's completely upside down where the balance sheets that seem to be desirable are actually all debt. Such balance sheets do not exist in reality. We do not have all debt balance sheets, uh, not for real world uh, markets because all debt goes back around to all equities permanently bankrupt. Uh, but not so for financial institutions because there's a third party that comes in uh, uh, when they have very little uh, equity and it uh, makes whole. So when you have very little equity, everything works fine when uh, assets go up. 
uh, as subprime lender uh, borrowers have, have uh, experienced for a little while while housing prices uh, went up. However, uh, when um, equity is low, which financial institutions are very good at maintaining very low, uh, even small uh, declines in asset value can cause distress. And so the question is, so Basel uh, it does introduce a total leverage ratio, and that ratio is 3%. 3% of total balance sheet. That is the kind of number that uh, is not heard of in any part of the economy. And the question that we have to ask is, is this leverage uh, part of banking uh, business? Uh, and are banks inherently fragile like that and highly leveraged like that? This is a question uh, on which uh, the amount of confusion is staggering in this world, I've discovered. And uh, it is a mantra and a belief, and sometimes it doesn't even have to be justified, that equity is expensive. And we cannot, even though we really need more stability and everybody pays lip service to more and more, more capital, everybody, even Ellen Greenspan, uh, that uh, somehow it's, it's, it's expensive and we cannot allow, afford to have more of it. We are told that if we were to increase uh, capital requirements, then there will be a credit crunch, even though we had a credit crunch when there was too much leverage. I got confused about that. Um, and growth will suffer and cost of credit will go up and a lot of bad things are happening, threats, and we will kill banks, kill banks, they will no longer be able to live if they had to fund themselves with 20%, 30% equity. That would be the end of the world according to uh, Diamond, Ackerman, other banks. So let me give you the good news. The good news is it's false and wrong. It's simply wrong. It contradicts everything we know in uh, corporate finance, and it is uh, simply uh, wrong. It's the only right way in which banks will be killed if they have to fund with more equity is uh, if they only live off subsidies completely. Because the paradox, the big, big paradox of this whole area is that we have an activity named leverage uh, which creates negative externality and yet we have a system in which it's subsidized. In the rest of the world we usually do not subsidize pollution, but in this part of the world, we subsidize something with negative externalities. Through the tax system, through guarantees, uh, debt is more attractive as a form of financing, and then we're surprised that bankers fight furiously when you try to take it away or reduce it. And so the big secret is, that I will tell you here, and that uh, seems to be kind of obvious uh, and yet not well understood, is that there is no reason for this high leverage. There's no economic first principle reason. So the new economic thinking of banking is actually basic corporate finance to begin with. Uh, and basic corporate finance will tell you that the only reason banks love leverage and risk is because, and they convince themselves that return on equity is a measure of uh, value, uh, which is false, uh, except to their shareholders because it squeezes more, more um, subsidies out of the rest of the world, uh, is the, uh, the, there, there is no good reason. The only reason they like it is because of subsidies, uh, really, in the end of the day. And it is true that part of their business includes leverage, but not to this degree, not to the degree of 97% of balance sheet. Uh, so that's the good news. Now, the bad, and, and there's another piece of good news. The other piece of good news is that we can impose higher capital, restruct, uh, capital structures, uh, capital requirements and higher equity requirements if we had the political will to do that, if countries actually took seriously the fact that the best way to deal with too big to fail is to require self-insurance and ownership of your decisions uh, that most companies in the world, all but banks, uh, operate under, which is you enjoy the upside and pay for the downside of your decisions. Uh, requiring banks to do a little more of that would go a long way. Uh, and now what we're told is, first of all, by Ellen Greenspan, they're too complex to regulate. Then we're told by every banker in every state that uh, it has to be a level playing field and we cannot increase capital requirements in UK, and Gordon Brown referred to it at lunch, because uh, it's it gotta be the same everywhere. 
Uh, and then we're also told uh, about shadow banking and how increasing capital requirements would uh, increase risk because all the activities would uh, go to the shadow banking system. Some combinations of these and, of course, the claim that, uh, that, that we will kill banking uh, were sound in Davos and are sound every day in the paper if you, uh, if you read it. And all of this is also false because actually the shadow banking system is a system most of which are a vast... Uh, part of is traced straight into regulated industries through subsidiaries and entities that were potentially under the radar screen of regulators if they only wanted to look there. Um, and besides, to say that activities would, reg would migrate to unregulated industry is a defeatist approach to any regulation because if that's what you're going to say, then what are you actually proposing? Uh, the shadow banking system developed under lower capital regulation, and if we increase them, uh, then it would still be there, and we still will have the problem. So what are we actually doing here? What we need to do is to determine that we want to define uh, the activities that need to be regulated, the entities that need to be regulated, see if we can get our hands around them or require them to simplify their structures somehow, and then for countries to realize that subsidized industries are not contributing to economic growth. Financial industry has uh, gone, gotten big in the UK, uh, potentially on account of other parts of the economy. And so when Gordon Brown complains that UK and the US uh, are not part of the global economy as much, then it's quite possible that, uh, that uh, a misallocation of resources, including human resources, has gone to the financial industry because other industries cannot compete uh, with, uh, with the conditions uh, of the financial industry which have gotten very rich in the last uh, 20 or 30 years. So, um, so now what the challenges are, their challenges are huge. Um, and part of what we saw in Basel is, uh, is that national, uh, that even when people come to Basel to work on it together, they bring their national interests uh, I'm over time by that. Oh, I, I thought it's going in my favor here. <laughs> <laughs> I keep getting more time. <laughs> I will end. Um, uh, national, nationals be, uh, are playing a game where they uh, bring their lobbyists to Basel and everywhere, and that's a problem that uh, we all have to face up to. But if we wanted to, we could. Thank you. Thank you.